Hey everyone, and welcome to today's event. Before we begin, let me briefly tell you about Expressia. We at Expressia are a team of people passionate about helping others design and deliver better experiences. With our online platform, you can build data-rich customer journey maps and make your personas come alive, and do that all together with your teammates in real time. We've also got a consulting team that conducts public and corporate workshops on all things journey mapping and interviews, as well as Expressia Academy with its interactive courses and our free community events. Today, we'll be talking about the next steps to take once you finish building your very own buying journey. And we couldn't have had a better guest expert today, as he wrote an entire book on how customers buy and why they don't. Make sure to check it out. The link is in the description. It's really amazing. Not only is he an author, but he's been mapping customer buying journeys for 20 years and flipped the emphasis from the product and why someone should buy to the customer and how they buy. They have mapped journeys for healthcare, financial services, industrial equipment, and many, many more. The rest I will leave to him. So welcome everyone, founder and CEO of Market Partners Inc., Martin Lewis. Martin, glad to have you back. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yulia, it's my pleasure to be back. It's always a pleasure to talk about uh, the buying journey. And what a great topic we've got that, uh, okay, we've mapped the buying journey. And for those of you that were with us last time, I talked about mapping the buying journey. And so now what? Um, sometimes it's obvious, but maybe it's less than obvious. And to me, it's, it's a major strategic move for any company after you've mapped the buying journey, now what? So that's what we're gonna talk about. As we go through this, we're going to essentially, in the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to look at, okay, now what do we do after we've mapped the buying journey? We're going to look at the new role, the sales, marketing, support, service, user experience, customer experience. We're going to wrap that up into that term CX, but the new role. And we're going to look at how do you design the complete CX management architecture? Then we'll allow ourselves 10 minutes for questions, discussion and answers later. So that's it. So as you have said, uh, my background is I've been in sales and marketing for my entire career, but became uh, passionate about how customers buy some 15, uh, 18 years ago when we started talking to our customers' customers. As a company, this is what we do. We help companies map buying journeys. And then now what? We help them optimize sales, marketing, their UX, their CX, around how customers buy. We think it is the most important thing. So you have said we've mapped buying journeys across the board. We've mapped buying journeys for B2B and B2C organizations across a wide selection of industries. Point being that this applies to just about anything that's being sold, serviced, and supported. The point I made last time, and for those of you with me last time, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes summarizing what we did last time. Buyers are buying differently today. This started about 20 years ago. What we've really seen is three generations of sellers. The first generation uh, go back to when people used to buy stone wheels or whatever it was. People knew exactly what they wanted. They knew exactly where they go. They normally had one source, local. They didn't go outside of their village. They bought inside their village from people they knew. Then we saw with the advent of radio, TV, and phone, that communication approach changed how people buy. People were able to reach out further to suppliers. They were able to learn more about what other people were doing, and they had choice. With the internet, what we've seen again is another total disjointed way that people buy. So today, we call it third-generation buyers. Typical third-generation buyers have information at their fingertips. They have the ability to network. They have the ability to find out about us who supply them and support them. They have the ability to reach out to other people like them that utilize the same kind of products and services. They also have, thanks to this wonderful world we live in, very limited time and resources. But they have got almost unlimited possibilities to invest time and resources. Sometimes we think we're the only company offering them the kind of value proposition we're offering. We're far from the only company. There's many people out there offering to reduce costs, increase market share, make life better for you. So there's many possibilities, unlimited possibilities for them to invest the time and resources they do have. 
There's no longer a single decision maker. Decisions are made through a dynamic network of decision influencers. They're saturated with great offers. Not a day goes by without them hearing about some new thing they can do. And they're suffering from market fatigue. So that's a third generation buyer. What does it mean? It means there's a gap. Look at some of these numbers from our research. We've talked to over two and a half thousand buyers in B2B and B2C. They're usually, um, suppliers are usually engaged in less than 10% of the overall buying journey. So when we map the buying journey and we look at all the activities customers do, the supplier is only involved in 10% or less of those activities. Buyers don't connect with the supplier until they're 50% of the way through their buying journey. Some of the other numbers that I find just amazing, and there must be a call to action here, is 90% of buying concerns, 90% of the things that buyers get concerned about. When I talk about buying and buying journeys, I'm talking about end to end, not just the acquisition. I'm talking about from when they first start the buying journey, right the way through to the ongoing relationship they have with the supplier. And 90% of the concerns that they have, the anxieties are not addressed by a supplier. And then more than 70% of supplier's energy is directed at proving the value of their, their offering. And yet customers already know that. So bottom line, buyers are disconnected from suppliers. Suppliers are disconnected from buyers. What was once a very tight and dependent connection where the buyers were very, very dependent on the suppliers to help them, to help them with their purchase, to help them with their usage, to help them with their adoption. This is now a broken link. There is a huge gap between selling and buying. So what must we do? And this is what it really comes down to when we start looking at, so now what do we do when we map the buying journey? Company, companies must reconnect with their buyers across the end-to-end -end buying journey. So we must strive to connect with our buyers throughout their entire journey with us from start to finish, if there even is a finish. However, buyers are not dependent upon suppliers, so we must develop a very deep understanding of our customer's buying journey. And if we fail to do that, we risk just becoming a supplier at will, that we lose control, that our, our customers will only do business with us when they need to, and we've really lost control of what's happening. So we talk about the buying journey. So what's the buying journey? Well, it starts with an idea, an experience, or discovery. So somewhere, somehow, somebody goes, wow, maybe we could do this, or we should take a look at that. Then many things happen and many people involved, the long and winding road. It may stop, it may slow down, it may backtrack, it could loop around. And it may eventually, may eventually involve actually acquiring something and change in the organization. And it's likely to go on for some time. So that's the buying journey. So when I talk about buying journey, that's what it is. And that's what we're going to map. And indeed, that's what we're going to manage. So the good news, the good news for our research, that within a specific market, buyers buy in remarkably similar ways. Let's pause and think about that for a moment. In a particular market, buyers buy in a, in a predictable way. They worry about the same things, the same kind of people get involved. They're looking for the answer the same way. They're looking for the same kind of service, support, and experience. In fact, that's now how we define a market. We define a market as buyers that buy in a very similar way. For instance, people that buy cars, that's not a market. People that buy a Honda SUV versus a Ferrari, those are two different markets that should be considered as such. So markets buy in very similar ways. Therefore, we can decode what we call the DNA of the buying journey. The DNA is like the, the fingerprint. It's what defines the market. It's how they buy. And then what we can do is we can map that buying journey, and then we can determine how we're going to manage that buying journey. What comes after mapping the buying journey? Managing the buying journey. So three things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about mapping the buying journey very briefly. Then we're going to talk about how do you create an organizational-wide market engagement strategy? And then how do you develop the new approach, the new CX approach, the new selling approach, the new marketing approach? So those are the three things we're going to talk about. 
So mapping the buying journey. We talked about this last time. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the end-to-end -end buying journey. And very briefly, what we're going to do is going to look at all the activities that go on across that buying journey and the various steps that a customer would go through from beginning to end. We're going to look at who gets involved, the personas, who gets involved and when. Then we're going to look at the buying style. How do they know what they're going to buy? How do they know where they're going to buy it from? So the buying style, and we'll talk about that a little later. We'll talk about the value drivers. What is it that people are looking for? What motivates people? What keeps people going across their buying journey? What are they searching for? What do they want? What are their aspirations? And then most importantly, we'll look at the buying concerns. What is it that slows down or stops the buying journey? What is it that starts a buying journey and then somewhere on the line, it slows down, stops or backtracks? What are the concerns? So that's the map we draw of the buying journey. And I shared with you last time some examples of the maps. And, and essentially when, when we map a buying journey like this, we'll have a, a report that in fact, here's one here that we did for a client just last week. It's 50 pages long of really understanding what happens with the customer across that buying journey. I also shared with you a case study, which we're going to use today, a case study of an orthopedic surgery buying journey. This was a um, orthopedic surgery center here in California that wanted to understand how their customers were buying. Of course, they're buying surgery. So this was a very interesting buying journey to decode because we discovered that people are trying very hard not to buy. So they have a joint pain, their knee gets stiff or whatever. And the last thing they want is surgery. So they're not looking to buy surgery. They do not want surgery. They go to great lengths to avoid Void surgery. It starts with when you realize that that pain in your hip, your, your joint, your knee or whatever isn't going away and it's getting worse. That's the start of the buying journey. It doesn't mean that you're going to go out and get surgery right there and then. In fact, it means you're going to start trying to avoid surgery. And then hopefully the buying journey ends when you've got a healthy joint back, when your lifestyle is uh, regained and you feel better. But how do they decide where to go for surgery? So we mapped out the buying journey. We started with the triggers, what starts it? Well, it's that joint pain. And then we looked at how do people go through this? So with that joint pain, they realize they have to do something. The last thing they want to do is surgery. So they start doing acupuncture or they start rubbing different ointments on their knee or they wear um, different kind of bandages or contractions. They're doing many things to avoid surgery. So they keep looping back. They keep going back and say, what else can I do because I've got this knee pain? No, I don't want surgery. What else can I do? So they keep going backwards in the, in the buying journey. Then there's a tipping point somewhere in the buying journey, <laughs> maybe years when they're limping around, they can hardly walk. Somebody says to them, you know, I was like you and I went to see Doc Martin. He's fantastic. And that's the tipping point when they go, perhaps I should look at surgery. So that's the moment when they tip. That's not the start of the buying journey. The start of the buying journey was them getting that pain in their joint and realizing it wasn't going away. But they avoid surgery and then there's this tipping point when they decide to have surgery. Now we map this entire buying journey and I'm not going to go into the detail. There it is using Uexpressia. Um, we love that tool because we can collaborate, we can see everything. So I'm just going to show you a quick snapshot of, of kind of that's what we looked at when we mapped this buying journey. We looked at the activities, we looked at the touch points when they reach out, they want some information. We looked at the buying style, their value drivers, the buying concerns, the emotions, and we had quotes. So that's what we mapped the, uh, in terms of the buying journey. So now the topic of this session is, I've mapped the buying journey, now what do I do? Well. You craft the market engagement strategy. How are you as a company? Not as a sales department, not as a marketing department, not as CX, not as UX, not as service, not as support. As a company, how are you going to engage in this marketplace? So the new role for sales, marketing, UX, CX, service, support, every customer facing function of the organization and all those that support the customer facing organization. 
Your role is to manage, to support that buying journey, to navigate customers through that buying journey. So that doesn't mean just following them. And this is such a, an important point. This doesn't mean just reacting, giving the customer what they want at that time. This means actively supporting them and managing them through that buying journey and maybe changing the buying journey, maybe changing the buying journey, deliberately change the buying journey, deliberately knowing that at this point, they are not considering surgery. How can we make it so they consider surgery earlier? So you're going to manage and you're gonna influence the buying journey. You gotta be relevant at each stage of the buying journey and positively influence the buying journey. If you're not positively influencing the buying journey, why are you there? If customers were gonna go through that buying journey and you're going to do nothing about it, then we really don't need that investment in sales, marketing, UX, and CX. The whole reason that you're there, the whole reason all this is about is to positively influence the buying journey, to actually change the buying journey. What does that mean? Well, here's an interesting thing. There's four and only four ways that we can influence the customer buying journey. So all that we do in sales, in marketing, UX, CX, service support, all of that customer facing investment is for four and only four things. The first thing is to start a buying journey, to get somebody somewhere into a buying journey that otherwise wouldn't have been in a buying journey. They learn about you, they hear about you, and they're now in a buying journey. So the first thing is to get into somebody into a buying journey. Once they're into a buying journey, then the second thing is expedite it. Increase the probability that they will complete the buying journey. So in increase the probability the customer will go through their complete buying journey, be happy and satisfied, and obviously working with you. Number three is complete it. My apologies, expedite is speed it up. So speed up the buying journey. Get somebody to go through the buying journey faster than the other would, would, wise would have. Number three is complete the buying journey. As I said, make sure that they do complete their buying journey. And number four is to augment. Get customers to commit more, spend more. So everything we do comes down to those four things. Get somebody into a buying journey that otherwise would not be. Get somebody through a buying journey faster than they would normally go through it. Get somebody to complete the buying journey with us and get them to increase spend. So all of that classical CX at the back end is largely aimed at getting customers to do more business with us or act as referrals, a net promoter for us to get other people into buying journeys. It's not just to give them a happy time so they tell everybody you're great. That's nice, that's good, but it's not the, what we want. What we really want is that to result in other people engaging in buying journeys with us. So those are the four things that we want from positively influencing the buying journey. Now, given that, we're then going to develop what I call a market engagement strategy. And like I said, this is a corporate wide strategy. How are we as a company going to engage in that buying journey? How are we going to engage in our market? What are we going to do? And there's five elements to the market engagement strategy, which I will share with you. Number one is to align to the buying style. I said we'd go a little bit deeper into the buying style. Let's do so. In the mind of the customer, and this is our first thing of our strategy, in the mind of the customer, when they buy, there's two questions. Where do I buy? What do I buy? Where do I buy? On the left-hand side of this diagram, customers believe they have choice. Now we've called that commodity, but don't get hung up in the, the title. We just call it commodity. The most important thing is what's in the customer's mind. In this buying journey, the customer believes they have choice. They can go with supplier A, supplier B, product X, product Y. They have choice. At the end of the day, they know that one may be more available or cheaper than the other, but they approach this with choice. On the right-hand side of the equation, there is something about a particular product or brand that will pull them to that every time. They don't approach their buying journey as if they have choice. They go into their buying journey with the belief that one product, one brand, one company is who they want to go to. They, um, so 
I, I happened to buy three BMWs in a row. So for whatever reason, I wasn't shopping around. For whatever reason, I like BMWs and I was gonna buy a BMW time and time again. The second axis, again, it's polarized, nothing in between. At the bottom, the customer perceives they know exactly what they want. At the top, the customer has a challenge and they don't know what they want. They may be looking for car tires and they don't have the expertise they don't have the time, they don't have the knowledge to work out what kind of tire they want on their car. They take their car to the dealer or their favorite tire store and say, could you please put new tires on for me? So they don't know exactly what they want. They lack the knowledge, time, experience to make that decision. They outsource it to the seller. They say, help me, what should I do? If we put these two together like this, we get four ways in which people buy. This is incredibly important. It's where we start with understanding how we're going to manage that buying journey. So where is the buying journey? Is it in the bottom left? This buying journey is people that believe they know exactly what they want and they have choice. This is where people shop around. They issue RFPs, they want special discounts. They know exactly what they want and they believe they can shop around. So that is a buying style. Top right is a totally different buying style. We call that the trusted advisor, that I'm looking for somebody to help me. I want to reach out to somebody and it's got to be the same person. So maybe um, I'm looking to install a global IT infrastructure and I'm going to turn to Accenture because Accenture has helped us before. They're a company with worldwide resources. They understand how I should put in this IT infrastructure. I'm going to turn to them and they can do this for me. Top left. We used to call this the yellow pages. Now we call it the Google. People want help. Let's just say they, they've won some money on the lottery and they want to talk to an accountant about investing it and paying minimum amount of tax. So they Google to see who's available, who do they like the look of, who's available today. They believe that they need somebody that can help them, but there's many people available to help them. Bottom right, we call this the Starbucks quadrant people that want a coffee, they know exactly what they want, they want a coffee, but they're willing to drive six blocks out of their way, they're willing to go through that complicated ordering process to get that Starbucks cup. So that's the Starbucks quadrant, people know what they want, but they know that it's gotta be this particular brand. So here's how that matters to us and why it's number one on market engagement strategy, that we have never found any example of a brand and I will use that term brand, that has been successful on a sustained basis selling in more than one of these quadrants. You've got to pick one. And if people are buying a different way, they are not your market. If you're selling BMWs, you're going to sell to people who want BMWs. If people come in the, sh the store and they, stop, they shop you against Ford, Toyota, Chevy, or whatever, then... Um, and they're, they're trying to get you down on price, they're a different kind of buyer. So you've got to pick one. You've got to then sell the way the customer's buying. So if the customer isn't buying in that quadrant, you've got to try and move them into that quadrant. You've got to change how they're buying. You've got to change their perception of what they want to buy and where they want to buy. And then the most important thing, and the reason why you can only be successful in one of these quadrants, you've got to optimize the company around that quadrant. I'll come to that in a moment. And then you've got to determine what do you do with buyers that are buying a different way? And the answer is do nothing. You may be able to address them through partners or a different brand, Toyota and Lexus. Toyota is more bottom left, Lexus is more bottom right. So you can have a different brand. And then let's just look at what I mean by optimize. And this is why you can only be successful in one of these quadrants. If your customers are buying top right, if they're looking for that kind of expertise, you've got to be a thought leader. You've got to invest in that expertise. You've got to invest in relationships and very high touch relationships with your customers. If it's bottom right, it's very, very different. You've got to be available. You've got to have low operating costs so that you can get the price down. You've got to have presence at the point of decision. You've got to be there when customers make a decision that they want to do something. You've got to be there in their mind because there's other people they can go to. It's highly competitive 
and customers, you've got to be able to provide them choice and a high utility and ease of doing business. In the top left, marketing, you've got to market yourself. You've got to market your expertise. You're going to have competitive pricing, but not the best pricing. And you've got to look at service and support. In the bottom right, you've got to promote what it is that makes you unique. What is it about people that want the Starbucks experience or a BMW? You've got to promote what it is that people perceive is unique about your brand, your offering. You've got to then continuously reinforce that value and you've got to have operational excellence. This is why this matters so much. This is why you can't operate in more than one of these four quadrants because the whole company has to be aligned and invest in different things in order to be dominant selling to customers who are buying in these different quadrants. So that is the buying style. Item one, when it comes to how do I positively influence the buying journey. Number two is trigger engage. Do I choose to trigger this buying journey or will I engage in the buying journey? Once a customer is in the buying journey, do I engage? So let's make this come to life. Let's go back to our joint clinic, our surgery center. Where do they want to engage in the buying journey? Well, typically, this particular surgery center, we're waiting for people who had decided to have surgery. We change them from a surgery center to a joint health restoration center. So stop focusing on surgery, start focusing on offering people healthy joints. De-emphasize your surgeons and the qualifications and engage with potential partners earlier in the buying journey. So don't wait for somebody to think, I want surgery, now let me see if I can find a surgeon. Engage with them when they have that pain in their joint. Engage with them and offer them acupuncture, offer them physiotherapy, offer them those services directly or indirectly that will help them with their joint pain. Now that could mean that you're engaging with people years earlier than you normally would. The point is though, you are engaging much earlier in their overall journey. Now this is interesting because where that surgery center was, where they were leaving it to engaging when somebody decides to have surgery, people know what they want. They want surgery and they've got choices. So that buyer at that point was in the bottom left quadrant. So you were competing with other hospitals to provide that surgery. Engaging earlier is really interesting. Engaging earlier means that people don't know what they want. Well, they want the pain to go away, but they don't know whether they want acupuncture, physiotherapy, surgery. They are at that point in the buying journey, they are buying top right, very, very differently. So there, what you're doing is providing thought leadership in how to gain healthy joints. You're providing expertise, including such things as acupuncture and physiotherapy, highly relationship driven and high touch. So by changing from being a surgery center to a health joint restoration center, they're engaging with buyers who at that point in time are buying in a different way. So that's aligned to the buying style and triggering or engaging. Adequate motivation, number three, providing adequate motivation to keep people going through their buying journey. So in the case of the health joint restoration center, it's focusing on a healthy and active lifestyle. It's not focusing on surgery. It's focusing on people getting back their healthy and active lifestyle. That's what people want. That's what people are looking for. Fourth, how do you stay engaged and relevant? Remember that today suppliers are only involved in 10% of the overall buying journey. We want to be engaged. We want to be relevant. We want to provide value to people. We want to stay connected with people throughout their buying journey. So going back to our case study here, let's do regular checkups. Let's make sure that we talk to everybody on a monthly or quarterly basis. We'll schedule to meet with people, to stay involved, to see how they're doing, to see how the acupuncture works, see how the physio physiotherapy, we're going to follow up with them. We're not just going to reference them to a a physiotherapist and let it go. We're going to follow up. We're going to provide constant reinforcement about how you want to get back to that healthy lifestyle. And then provide webinars and seminars. In the early stages of the buying journey, defocus on surgery. Talk about the other things you can do. But yes, as it gets later into the buying journey, start doing webinars and seminars, 
on surgery. So that's staying engaged and relevant. The fifth component of five in developing our corporate-wide engagement strategy is overcoming friction. The most important thing in the buying journey is making sure people complete their buying journey. So in the case of the surgery center, not as difficult as some other things that we've seen, but we need to reduce the fear of surgery. We wanna make sure that people understand that this is a fairly straightforward procedure, that yes, it's going to take you out for a few weeks, but then the, the advantage is gonna be tremendous. We're gonna provide you with testimonials of how other people have had surgery. We will at this stage highlight our physician's credentials We'll share how others have recovered and make it very easy for people to say, yes, let's get this scheduled. So that's overcoming friction. So there it is. The first thing we want to do when we map the buying journey is determine our organizational, our corporate strategy for engaging, engaging in the market, but positively influencing that buying journey, not just leaving it as it is, but positively influence. How do we interact with customers and positively influence in one of those four ways how they move through the buying journey? So that's the second of the three things we're gonna talk about. Now we're gonna talk about, okay, so we've now got our strategy. We know what we wanna do. So now how do we do it? This is where we're going to develop our total uh, CX approach across the organization. This is, this it, to me is so, so important. What we're going to do is we're gonna take our strategy and we're going to look at the buying journey. So there's the buying journey. We've mapped the buying journey, there it is. We've looked at what are the steps people go through from start to end, what activities do they engage in? Who are the key players, the personas that get involved? What's their buying style? We talked about that with the four quadrants. What are they looking for? How are they motivated? What are their buying concerns? So that's the buying journey. We're now going to say, how are we going to impact that? What we're going to do is we're gonna design the, to find the specific activities that translate our strategy into action. This could be one of the most important slides I'm gonna share with you. So we look at that buying journey, we look at our strategy and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do at each stage of that buying journey to support the customer through that buying journey and positively influence the buying journey. So we're going to break down the buying journey as we have into those stages. I'm gonna say, what do we have to do to translate that strategy into action? Now on the surface, it seems fairly straightforward, but as you go deeper, this is a very sophisticated uh, exercise to understand exactly what do we have to do? What do we have to do to translate our strategy into action across the buying journey. Then when we've got the activities, this is when to me, it gets really exciting because it's great to say, well, we need to do this. We need to provide um, our potential patients with webinars. We need to consult with them. We need to keep in touch with them. We've done that. So now let's define the roles. Let's define who's going to do that. So right the way across our organization, aligned to each step, of the buying journey, who's going to do what? Who's responsible for doing those activities at each of the steps across the buying journey? Then we're gonna say, what skills and knowledge do they have? This to me is where it gets really exciting because we're enabling people to do this. We're not just saying your job is to keep the customer happy. We're saying, here are the activities you've got to engage in and here's the skills and knowledge that you need in order to do that successfully. Then we can say what tools and content do people need? So what tools, what technologies, what approaches, like what do people need in order to do that? So we now know who's gonna do what, what skills and knowledge they want, and then what do they need to do that? And then finally, let's put measurements in place. Let's measure, but let's not measure just blindly. Let's measure each stage of the buying journey. So at that first stage where we engage with somebody, let's measure that. And then we'll measure what's going on at each stage. What are the key metrics at each stage of the buying journey? Now, this is really exciting because you're measuring the actual buying journey. You're measuring what's happening outside of your organization. You're measuring the key metrics of people going through their buying journey, not you going through a selling journey, but 
how are people going through their buying journey? Then in order to make this all come alive and actually work it, we use your Expressia. Um, now, I'm not here to promote your Expressia, but thank you for hosting us. Uh, we find this just an incredible tool because of its flexibility. So there it is. That was the buying journey that we mapped out in your Expressia for the orthopedic surgery center. Here is now the complete CX management architecture. What I just described to you, and I simplified this a little so that I can put it on the screen, but here, are the, here is exactly the same steps of the buying journey. We know the buyer's goals and we know the buyer's activities from mapping the buying journey. So here's now what we're doing. This is the, now we've mapped the buying journey, so what? So here it is. What are our activities at each stage of the buying journey? What are the roles? What skills and knowledge, tools, content, and metrics? So to give you a little example, let's look at activities. So we've defined in the blue, here's what the buyer, here's what our patient is doing. And then in the white, these are, this is what we should be doing. So these are the activities we should engage in with that buyer as they're going through the buying journey. If we look, looked at another one, here are the roles. So in this example, we can see the roles, the consultant, the physician, the scheduler, um, the assigned nurse, the support staff. So we can actually assign the activities to various roles. And then finally, skills, tools, and metrics. Here it is again, just blowing up that bit of your expressy here. What are the skills, tools, what are the skills, the knowledge, the competencies that people need? What are the tools they need to do their job? And what metrics? We can measure things like how long does it take us to get back to somebody when they first connected with us? We can have uh, customer satisfaction surveys, whatever it is, but they're all aligned to each step of the buying journey. So there it is. That's what we call the complete outside in because it starts with the customer outside in CX management architecture. What that means, and this is the now what in terms of you map the buying journey, now what? You, you now have an organizational map aligned to a very deliberate strategy of how you're going to engage with that customer at each step of the buying journey. Not just reacting to them, but actually positively influencing, which may mean, as I said, you actually change the buying journey. You may deliver information, you may provide an experience that will bring people forward in their buying journey. So you may be changing the buying journey, but what you've got here is a map. And if you look at it, we did this work, we've done this work in multiple companies. You've actually then aligned and coordinated the entire organization or all the customer facing part of the organization to your strategy. And you've made it clear what roles and responsibilities go throughout the organization to translate your strategy into action. To me, that is a highly strategic and massively effective approach to the, the, what we call the CX management architecture. So there it is, that's what we've talked about. We've talked about mapping the buying journey. What does that involve? How do you do it? And what do you end up with? So that's mapping the buying journey. A, a comment there, as I used before, we believe there is nothing, no substitute, but to go out there and have one-on-one -on -one interviews with customers. We have only ever dealt with one organization that was successful in mapping their buying journey. And that was because many of their people came, they were buyers that came in and formed the company. So they really had a good insight to what goes on. We usually find that organizations trivialize um, the, the, what customers go through and there's so many things that are hidden. Well, think about it. If you're only involved in 10% of buyer activities, how do you know what those other 90% are? So not to be critical, but we see most people when they map a buying journey, it's what they imagine, hope, or wish their customers go, for, go through. You've really got to understand the entire buying journey from the customer's perspective. So map the buying journey. With the customer, with the customer buying journey mapped, now what? Firstly, craft the market engagement strategy. How are we as an organization going to meaningfully engage in this marketplace to the customer's success and to our success? And then based on that, develop the entire approach that goes through marketing, demand generation, sales, service, support, 
the whole what we call CX management architecture. How are you going to translate that strategy into actions across the company? Why would you do this? <laughs> You'll do this in my mind to stay in business because companies that don't do this are gonna have a very tough time over the next few years, I believe. But generally, what do we see? This leads to greater resource alignment. So you've got the resources across those various functions aligned much more to a strategy and aligned uh, to each other. You've got a scalable and repeatable process. You know what you're doing, you can measure it. And you're looking at it again, not how you imagine it's working. The acid test is how is it impacting the customer's buying journey? You've then got a totally superior CX approach. Your win and retention rates of customers should be much, much superior. You are totally customer centric. You are aligning your organization to how customers are buying, how you want them to buy and how they're going to buy, not how you imagine they buy or how you wish they buy. And then of course, all the training, support, tools, technology that you're providing to people, they can be meaningfully applied to the right resources, doing the right things at the right time. So over the last 45 minutes, we've talked about, you've mapped the buying journey, now what? We've talked about the new role for sales, marketing, and CX of positively managing the buying journey. And then we've talked about how to design and complete the whole CX management architecture. So with that, we're gonna turn over to questions, answers, hopefully, and discussion. I'll put up our resources slide so that for you, we wanna provide resources. Obviously, um, the book, um, as Julia said, um, how customers buy and why they don't, all of this content is in the book. Uh, we also, of course, our own website, market-partners.com, the blog and resources, we try and keep that fresh with meaningful content for people who are mapping and managing buying journeys. Uh, we can be reached on LinkedIn. Please follow us on LinkedIn. We, as I said, we try and provide thought leadership, best practices. And uh, Anthony Roker, who's on this session, um, is my support person. And he could be reached at anthony.roca at market-partners.com. Connect with him for anything you'd like, including a complete copy of this presentation. So with that, let's turn to questions, comments, and discussion. Yeah, and before we do that, Martin, firstly, thank you so much. That was an absolute blast of a talk. We did send the link to the book on the chat. Make sure to check it out. It's absolutely incredible. And if you want to ask a question, with a voice, just unmute yourself and ask it if typing is not for you. It's, um, I will, I, I will, I would see if there's any questions. I'll, I'll share one of my favorite stories of the day. And uh, you probably know that uh, Jeff Bezos in his uh, spacecraft, uh, Blue Origin, uh, became an astronaut earlier today. Um, Richard Branson had his flight just, what, two weeks ago? Very, very interesting, Richard Branson. When he landed after going into space, he was asked about his voyage. And the whole mission, he said, if you recall, was evaluating the customer experience. Because obviously his business is now going to be selling extremely expensive seats for people that want to become astronauts. And his, when he landed, he said, I wanted to evaluate the customer experience. So there it is. Uh, Richard Branson probably um, great entrepreneur, always thinking of the customer experience. And if you look back at his various Virgin companies, they really have been customer centric. But I thought that was a wonderful thing when he said that what was he doing in space? He was evaluating the customer experience firsthand. Just terrific story, I thought. We have our first question. Uh, yeah. Anthony. How did how did you get to the solutions in your outside in architecture? Is that created by the consultants or by the client or both? Well, uh, we of course are consultants. So we like to provide the expertise, guidance and facilitation to help companies with that. But there's, there's, we don't have any lock on the way that's done. In fact, it's all in the book. Uh, so we facilitate the process going through what I shared with you. Um, we do it 
very inclusively. We do not come in as a consultant and we think this is really important. We don't come in and say, this is what we should, you should be doing. So it really is your organization that decides. You decide how are you going to engage in that marketplace? Which of those four quadrants are you going to be dominant in? You decide and you look at, okay, what are the implications of that? What does that mean we have to do? So we run a series of workshops and interviews and what we call coordination forums, which is intense focus groups, uh, looking at the implications of all of that and also making sure that people don't overreach. It's great to say we want to do this, but can you afford it? Have you got the talent to do that? Can you go and acquire the talent to do that? So we want to make sure that people always come out with a strategy that is going to be successful and is also achievable. So you walk through those steps. We do that with our clients. You walk through those steps and saying, which of those four quadrants are we going to align to? We're going to trigger engage. So those five steps, the market strategy, you, you walk through those. Think of the implications. Think of how you're going to do that. Um, utilizing people from across the organization to do that. When we design the activities, we want the people that do that to be involved. The last thing, again, we would do as consultants is come in and design that. So when we're looking at how do you do, uh, what's the best selling approach, we want the people on the front line to contribute to that. We want their best practices that they're currently doing. We want to understand the hurdles that they would see in order uh, in, to do the things. So we want to work that as a, as a very, uh, uh, very inclusive uh, program to bring out the best practices, to have people involved, to understand what it's going to take and um, what's required to do that. So the answer is always with the organization. And hopefully, as a consultant, we help you speed that up and we bring the expertise of how to do that. But um, like I said, we don't have a lock on it. Um, you could do that yourself. Yeah, Anthony. Where is the most common spot that businesses fail after creating the CX management strategy? They, um, <laughs> they get ahead of their skis. They dream up wonderful things that they can do and they don't commit to what does that mean? And we see this time and time again. We're going to do this for our customer. We're going to provide great service. We're going to do this. But what does that translate to? What does it mean you have to do? What does it mean you need to do to enable people to do that? You don't just train people in how to provide great customer service. You gotta make sure they've got the approaches, the skills, the tools, that the obstacles that are there that prevent them are taken away from them. Um, we did some work with a call center that it was quite incredible when we started to analyze what was going on. Um, the company had, I won't go into too much detail here, but the company had multiple things that were going wrong with the customer. And if a customer gets a delayed delivery or gets the wrong component, whatever it is, they phone the call center. So the call center was actually being used to patch up all of the problems across the organization. <laughs> so the call center were experts at logistics, at shipping stuff and whatever. That is a bad process. If you look at Deming, that's really bad because the problem lies back with why are you shipping the wrong product to the customer? So if you ship the wrong product to the customer, you should correct that. You shouldn't put in a better service department that talks to customers when they've got the wrong product and helps them get the right product. So what we find is that companies dream up what they aspirationally would like to do, but they don't truly understand and commit to what it's going to take to do it. Uh, we have another great question here on the four quadrants of the buying style for customer to customer markets, like on eBay, would you expect buyers to be operating in all four quadrants? Should a platform like eBay attempt to support all four types of buyers or should they optimize for one quadrant? They should optimize for one quadrant. And um, what, it, what it means is you, you may have different platforms or different approaches for different quadrants. So if you've got a buyer that's coming in and buying differently, you may send them to a different place or manage them in a different way.
To get buy-in at each customer facing step, do you involve or allocate responsibility to department head slash stakeholders? Um, an example, um, contact center head stakeholder involved in agreeing and sharing the new customer facing actions and behaviors that support the new customer experience strategy, online team head and stakeholders agree and implement uh, the new customer experience service, et cetera. 100% uh, yes. The people who have been doing the job and will be the job have got to be involved in the strategy. They've got to be involved in how you translate that. Um, again, I see it so often that people come out with a, a great, and I won't even call it strategy, they come out with a great aspiration that we want to do this with our customers. But why aren't we doing it today? What is it that's holding people back? So we've got to really understand that. We've got to talk to the people on the front line, understand why do they do what they do? Um, why don't they do what we'd like them to do? And then we've got to look at, okay, what skills, knowledge, and competence do we need? Do we need to hire a different kind of profile of person? And then how do we remove the obstacles in their way so we, as I said before, we're, we're a huge believer and you've got to involve all those folk in the, in the program. Um, I don't want to give you the impression this therefore takes years. Uh, we'll go through a program like this in usually about six months um, from start to end. So it doesn't have to be years long, um, but it is... It does involve a lot of people across the organization. You want their input. You want their involvement. You don't want to go out there and tell people, well, this is what we want you to do. You want to find out what they're doing today and why they're doing it and what barriers may exist in, and what bridges have to be crossed in moving them from where they are to where they need to be. And I'll underscore that by talking about change management for a moment. So much of the work we do is change management. You're asking people to change no matter how small it's change and people, that's, that's tough. It's really tough. People cling to things. There's a status quo bias. Even if people know they should be doing something different, they still have that status quo bias of doing what they're doing because it feels comfortable. So this is a change management project without doubt. So you've got to look at, at that aspect as well. Anthony, other questions or thoughts? Well, this is like a perfect segue. Do you have any tips for designers who work in companies that don't have a CX culture? How can we engage and involve other professionals to believe, especially if they don't understand um, that it requires time to design good customer experience, thinking on the customer? Um, my answer to that one, I hope it resonates with you, is, is very simple. Voice of the customer. We always start our engagements by talking to our customers' customers. We talk to them um, very deeply, we, we've got a very robust approach to doing this. We don't survey, we don't ask closed questions. How would you rank them on a scale of one to 10? We listen to their story. We listen to their story of what they did through their buying journey, what they wanted, what they expected, what they found, who got involved, why they got involved, what happened. So we look very deeply. Then we've got the voice of the customer, we've got quotes. We find that drives the change. When you go to an organization and say, this is what your market is saying. This is what, the, and, and like I said, we, we, we keep away from the, you scored 4.2 on a customer satisfaction survey because you know, that, that, that's useful, but what does it mean? But when customers say that um, when you've got input that we tried um, repeatedly to get a, a proposal from this company, but it always took a couple of weeks. The competition were able to give us one in the, the same day. That's important. So the voice of the customer we find is the catalyst that drives these projects. It moves away from, I think we should do this, uh, to you think we should do that. It moves away from the subjectivity and the emotion of people's perspectives. When you have data on what your customers are doing, when you have data on what your customers are saying and why they're doing it, that, that really is the catalyst for change. Anthony, other questions before we summarize here? That is it for the questions for right now. Okay, terrific. Well, let, let's wrap up and pass back to Yulia. So really four key points, I think. Um, everything has to start with a very deep and accurate, robust understanding of the end-to-end -end buying journey, the voice of the customer, 
really understanding what customers are doing. Our objective then is to manage and positively influence that buying journey. This is the answer to the now what in the title of this, this webinar. What do we do after we've mapped the buying journey? We've got to look at how we're going to engage with customers and positively influence that buying journey. What does that mean? That means we develop an organizational wide market engagement strategy. How are we as an organization going to engage in our marketplace? And then finally, we translate, we translate that strategy into the complete, what we call outside in CX management architecture. It talks about what we're going to do, who does what, how are they gonna do it, how are we gonna enable them to do it and how are we going to measure it? So to me, that's kind of, um, now we've mapped the buying journey, now what? So um, Anthony, as you heard from, is a uh, contact. Please let Anthony know if we can help in any way, any questions you have. Uh, this is my passion. I always enjoy listening to you, what your experiences are, and sharing some best practices. But So by all means, reach out. Uh, we love to find out what's going on out there. With that, thank you very much, and I look forward to staying connected. Yulia. Martin, that was an absolute blast of a talk. Thank you so much for sharing such valuable information, and thank you for joining. I really hope you will take today's learnings and start implementing them in your own buying journey projects. If you want to see more events like this, make sure to check the upcoming ones at expressia.eventbuy.com or check the recordings we've got on this channel. Take care, and I will see you around.